Genesis chapter 43, and uh, before we get to uh, read the passage this morning, uh, let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Lord to bless this time in His Word today. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is as reliable, as true, as applicable today as it was in the day in which it was written. Oh, Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts by your spirit and touch us by the word. Use your word that as is sharper than a two-edged sword. Use your word to, to strengthen us, to heal us, to cut away those things in our lives which would be detrimental for us spiritually. And Lord, I pray that you would minister your grace unto our hearts by the proclamation of your word today. May Christ be glorified in everything that we do and give the words to say. Give a good understanding of, of that which is proclaimed today. And we commit this unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now a good portion of scripture is narrative. And uh, in, in narrative, we we become familiar with the, the storyline of Scripture. And that's important for us to understand the storyline of Scripture. It's interesting to follow that storyline of Scripture. However, beyond familiarization and beyond interest, for, for us, what is the spiritual benefit of the narrative of these narrative portions of scripture. I'll be honest that for many years I struggled with knowing if for preaching how I was supposed to tackle these uh, narrative portions of scriptures particularly Old Testament narrative portions. In the New Testament, as you go through the Gospels, as you go through the book of Acts, those are, those are narrative, but they are interwoven with Jesus preaching, Jesus teaching, the apostles preaching, and so that naturally is going to lend itself pretty easily to uh, preaching on those concepts. Now, there are many, many churches where... Uh, a preaching on a preaching a series of messages as we have been doing lately through a character in the narrative portion of a character like Joseph is just not going to happen in many churches. These passages are used more as moralistic examples, uh, a way to uh, illustrate old or illustrate New Testament truths. And uh, because of that, believers across the world today are completely lacking in their grasp of the significance and the benefit of Old Testament Scripture. And for many, the Old Testament is kind of a closed book as far as, uh, as, far as gospel truth. And for many, truth be told, they think of the Old Testament as the bad news, the New Testament as the good news. The Old Testament God is a God of vengeance, a God of wrath, a God of anger. The New Testament God is, is 180 degrees turned from there and a God just of uh, uh, sentimentalism and, uh, and just sappy love. And so, so people struggle to understand what is the Old Testament all about. And uh, I'm thankful for, in my life, I've had some ministry mentors, most of whom are either dead or long retired, 
uh, but some ministry mentors who's preaching, teaching, and writing about the benefit of the Old Testament was used. The Lord really used them powerfully in my life to open up my eyes uh, to see the benefit of the Old Testament as I had never seen before. And it was like a moment in which, you know, it's almost like when you put your glasses on in the morning or you put your contact lenses on in the morning, all of a sudden everything thing takes shape. It used to be all fuzzy, and now you can see. And it was about like that when it's like it finally clicked. Here is what we are to do with all of these Old Testament portions. Now, I would tell you that uh, today, truth be told, uh, preaching on Old Testament narrative, uh, that, that genre of, 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 of literature in the, in the scriptures, taking a passage, a, a section uh, of the scriptures and preaching through a narrative is actually, I would say, probably my most favorite uh, form of preaching to do and uh, to listen to. So, but the question, uh, the question that I want to come to this morning, first of all, is what is narrative? What is narrative? Narrative is a record of life, right? It's a record of life. And to get any benefit from the record of your life, uh, you think back, to get any spiritual benefit, what do you do? You look back to the chain of events, to the history of the events, and, and what God has done in your life how God has revealed himself uh, to you in your life using these various events to bring you to saving faith in Jesus Christ and to help you to grow as a Christian. And God has made himself known to you through his word, but in the, by the backdrop of the various events that you have experienced in your life. And so when we come to the narrative portions of the scripture, we need to look to these in this same way. When I come to these things, I'm going, I need to look for God. I need to look for the unfolding revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is God doing? How is he revealing himself? Who is he revealing himself to be in these events that have been recorded? In the book of Genesis, over and over again, we see how God saves people through the coming Savior, through the proclamation of one who will come, the Messiah who will come. And remember that the events that are recorded in the scriptures for us are recorded purposefully. What do I mean by that? You know, we don't have every event in the life of Abraham recorded, right? We don't have a, a running log of every day and every event. There were significant events in the life of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. There were significant events in all of these lives that are not recorded for us in Scripture. God gives us the events that he does for a purpose. And so we look at it, we dive in. Why did God show, give us, uh, record this incident for us? So as we read Genesis chapter 43 this morning, uh, dial in your radar, uh, put your radar on high, and, and, and pray that God would give you, as we read the chapter, eyes to see Jesus Christ. Pray that God would give you a sensitivity to be able to zero in on what we see about his work of saving people through the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. So Genesis chapter 43, we're going to read the entire chapter this morning. Now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when they, that is Jacob and his sons, when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back and buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him saying, the man solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face 
unless your brother is with you. If you send your brother, he's speaking of Benjamin here, the youngest son who did not go with them on the original trip to Egypt. If you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? And they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever." For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand. And take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise, go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your, older, your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the men took that present and Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt. And they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men. will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we were brought in so that he may make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys. And they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house and they talked with him at the door of the house and said, oh, sir. We indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, and so we have brought it back in our hand, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he, that is the steward, said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men to Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet and gave their donkeys feed. Then they made... Uh, made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that, that uh, they would eat, uh, eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. And he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God, be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. 
So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and came out. And he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself and them uh, by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked astonished at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. We see some, uh, what we see here in this chapter, what I want to zero in on this morning is I want to see uh, something of who God is here. You see, the attributes of God are mentioned in, there's a few attributes of God that are brought up in this chapter because they shape everything that we see in this narrative of Scripture. The great theme that, that has run through this narrative of Joseph and these events of his life are that God is sovereign. God is in control even in the most difficult and perplexing and confusing events of our lives, even when we are wronged and terribly wronged, yet God still sits on the throne and God is at work. God is sovereign. When we, say, when we use the word sovereign, we mean that God is absolutely in control of all things at all times, with no exceptions, okay? God is not in heaven wringing his hands, wondering what he is going to do if this happens, how he's going to work things out if that happens. Everything is in the, the hand of control of our sovereign God. Now, hand in hand with God's sovereignty, we refer to God's providence. God is not only in control of all things at all times, but he is working things together for good to, uh, in the lives of believers. And in all of his creation, God is at work in his provision, his providence. So sovereignty and providence really go hand in hand. You cannot have providence without sovereignty. Sovereignty is the big subject. In verse 14, uh, this verse stands out to me greatly in this passage. Uh, J uh, Jacob says to his sons, may God Almighty give you mercy before the man. God Almighty. This is the name of God El Shaddai. You've probably heard that term before. El Shaddai. Now when we hear that term El Shaddai, it makes us feel uh, this, this sense of, uh, uh, of, of calmness, right? God is in control. God Almighty. But really the, and the word El is the, is, refers to God. Shaddai is a Hebrew word that, that refers to devastation, it refers to an overwhelming assault. So El Shaddai is the God of devastations, the God of irresistible work, irresistible almighty power. And that's why it's translated here, Almighty God. This El Shaddai, this Almighty God, this God of devastating, irresistible work. Because of Jesus Christ, our advocate, because of Jesus Christ, the one who is sitting on the throne to make intercession for us as believers, uh, Jesus Christ is our advocate, our Joseph, our, uh, the one that is sitting on the throne of power that is merciful unto us 
Because of Jesus Christ, this almighty God deals with us in mercy and in peace and in grace. And that's what we see in this chapter. These are aspects of God's goodness. God's goodness. So the first thing that I want to see here this morning is that he is a God of mercy. We don't know how much time elapsed between Genesis 42 when the, when the brothers went to Egypt the first time and got grain in Egypt the first time and now when we come to chapter 43, remember Simeon had been left in Egypt because Joseph said, I want proof that the story you is, that you are telling me is true. And uh, he said, you leave Simeon here, and when you come back with your youngest brother, Benjamin, which was the full biological brother of Joseph, uh, the others were uh, sons of, jo of Jacob's other wife and, and her servant, Benjamin was the son of Rachel. Benjamin and Joseph were Rachel's two sons. When you come back and you bring your youngest brother Benjamin with you, then I will release Simeon to you. So Simeon is, uh, is locked up there in Egypt. They go back and think about poor Simeon. He's thinking, okay, my brothers are going to go home. They're going to make a quick turnaround. I mean, how many days of a journey is it? And uh, okay, I'll give them a week. And a week goes by. Okay, maybe two weeks. I'll be here soon. But time lingered and lingered and lingered because they didn't turn around and get back. It said they waited until all the food was gone. Poor Simeon. So they're dragging their feet. They got to the point where they were scraping the bottom of the barrel once again. And in fact, it makes it clear that if they didn't get back to Egypt to buy more food soon, they were going to die. So it had been a while here. And Simeon is still there locked up. And, uh, and Jacob here calls upon God to show his sons the same kind of mercy that was shown to him over the years. Now, mercy, we define theologically as that aspect of God, of the goodness of God, whereby because of Jesus Christ, we are spared from the trouble, from the judgment that we, that we ought to have, that is rightfully ours, that we deserve. So we deserve God's judgment, but because of Jesus Christ, that judgment is held back, that judgment was placed upon Jesus Christ, he paid the price for your sin if you are a Christian, and therefore we have mercy. We, the, we, judgment is withheld from us. Now up until this point, I don't know if you caught this or not, up until this point in the narrative portions that we've gone through, the father of Joseph is referred to interchangeably between, uh, sometimes he's referred to as Jacob, sometimes referred to as Israel, but most of the time he is referred to as Jacob. Jacob was the name that he was given at birth. But in chapter 32, so this is many years prior to this, God changed his name from Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter, to instead he called him Israel. Israel means prince with God. It was in that Genesis chapter 32, if you look back at that later on, very, very strange event that happened in Genesis 32. Jacob is about, to be, is about to be reunited with his brother Esau. He has terribly wronged his brother Esau. Esau has vowed revenge upon his brother Jacob. And Jacob says, my brother Esau is going to kill me. He said he was going to do it. He's probably going to kill me when he sees me. The night before he was to meet his brother Esau, uh, he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And here the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. 
So Jacob wrestles with God himself all night long, and it says he prevailed. And you read that, and you know, you read that and you scratch your head and you say, you don't wrestle with God and win, all right? It doesn't work that way. You don't wrestle with God and win, but yet it says that Jacob wrestled with God and prevailed. Now understand that Jacob did not best God here, okay? Uh, the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, it says, touched Jacob's uh, hip and dislocated his hip. That is a devastating injury that ends a wrestling match in a hurry, right? You don't wrestle anymore from that point. If your hip is dislocated, you are all done. This all-night wrestling match was a picture of Jacob's life to this point. To this point, Jacob lived his life thinking that he could outmaneuver God. Jacob lived his life thinking that he could orchestrate events in his pride, thinking that he could be, as so many people think today, that he could be master of his own destiny, that he could call his own shots, that he could direct his own life. And God here makes it clear to Jacob, when I touch you, when I cripple you, you don't move any longer. You're all done. You don't, you don't wrestle God. Jacob was fighting and struggling against this God who all along was determined to bless him. That's it. God was determined to bless him, to save him and to bless him. God could have crippled Jacob from the very beginning, but God was long-suffering. And when Jacob is crippled, when the angel of the Lord, when Jesus Christ touches his hip, dislocates his hip, Jacob stops fighting God and starts clinging to God. And said to the angel of the Lord, said to this pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, I must have your blessing. I must have your blessing. And that is how he prevailed against God. He got what he asked for when he finally stopped trying to fight and finally just started to seek the blessing by submission. All through his life, God had pursued Jacob with undeserved kindness. All through his life, God had pursued Jacob with undeserved blessing and having been crippled now by God for the very first time, finally, Jacob refers to God, not as the God of my father, but my God. My God. And here God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, from deceiver to a prince with God. And suddenly now, in, when we come to Genesis chapter 43, instead of this man being referred to mostly as Jacob, we come here and exclusively he is referred to by his new name, Israel. Israel. And so the stress here is that God is demonstrating his goodness. God is demonstrating to this man and his family mercy and peace and grace. Now these sons of Jacob, sons of Israel, they are chips off the old block. Chips off the old block of the old Jacob. And just as God had transformed Jacob when he was on a perilous journey, when he was in fear of his life, rightfully so, he was sure that his brother Esau was going to take his life. Now this man sees his conniving thug sons 
And they're about to set out on a perilous journey. They're about to go to Egypt. And for all they know, when they walk over the border of Egypt, their pictures are going to be on the post office walls. Thieves. Spies. They'll be incarcerated, executed on the spots. He turns to God and he prays that God would show that same mercy to his undeserving thug sons. Now here we are, thousands of years later. Here we are in 2020 and we live today in the recognition of the perilous nature of our times. As never before. You know, if nothing else, we are learning how fragile our peace is, right? right? We are learning how fragile health can be. We're learning how fragile everything that we used to think of as dependable, as far as humanly speaking goes. We're learning how fragile it really is. We live in perilous times. I mean, what crisis is going to befall us next? We are, we're like people in a, in a little boat in the middle of the, of the troubled waters of the sea watching the waves crashing over the bow and wondering, is the next wave going to be the one that takes me down? We need to remember daily that God is a God who is great in mercy. Great in mercy. You know, we don't deserve any good thing. You don't deserve any good thing. I don't deserve any good thing. If you got and if I got what we deserve today, what would we get? We would get eternal condemnation in hell. That's what we deserve. That's what's coming to us because we are sinners both by nature and by choice. But because of Jesus Christ, what do we get? We get mercy. God withholds that which we rightfully deserve. Psalm 136 goes through the, many of the events of the history of the nation of Israel. And after event after event after event, it says, here's what happened. And then what does it say? His mercy endures forever. And then this happened. Why? Because His mercy endures forever. And then this happened because His mercies endure forever. And the whole chapter, the whole psalm go, it just repeats that. And that is a template for how you and I are to see our lives. Why have things fallen out as they have? Because His mercies endure forever. And it's not that everything goes like we think it should go, but it certainly doesn't go like we deserve for it to go. It's the common even unnoticed thread that is woven into every event in the life of the believer, the mercy of God. This life is so full of uncertainty, but this uncertainty is only the case from our earthly perspective. We can trust without exception, without any possibility of an exception, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God always, always, always deals with you in mercy. Hallelujah for that. So here Jacob gathers his sons together and he said, may God Almighty grant you mercy. Number two, is God of peace. We see that uh, referred to in verse 23. Can you imagine the fear that they wrestled with as they made their way down to Egypt? Are we going to be arrested? Are we going to be uh, indicted as spies and thieves? I mean, we're going down. We're hoping to be reunited with Simeon. Has Simeon already been executed? I mean, after all, we thought we paid for this grain that we got the first time, but when we got home, our money was still with us. For all they knew, these thieves, their brother was just executed. Will Egypt be willing to sell us grain once again? 
when they got to Egypt, they weren't greeted as criminals. It baffled them. Instead, it was almost like more of a, a welcome home party. They were invited, this man that, that, that greeted them before, that they really, that left them scratching their heads. They didn't know what to make of him. Why is he asking us about our father? Why is he asking us if we had another brother? This man, this high-ranking official in Egypt, now he's inviting us over to his house for dinner? You thought they were scared before. Now they're really scared. You know, like they say, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And this has got to be going through their mind. Uh, so when they got to, J to, uh, to Joseph's house, the first, they start spilling the beans. They start explaining themselves furiously to the servants of Joseph's house. We don't know how in the world this happened. We gave the money. We got home. It was still in our packs. We got more than we expected. We don't know how this happened. But the Egyptian servant of Joseph points them to God's provision. Interestingly, he's referring to your God gave this back to you and the God of your father. We have every reason uh, where we stand today outside of the intervention of God because of Jesus Christ, we have every reason to fear the judgment of God. But instead, just like these undeserving sons of Jacob were treated like family, because of Jesus Christ, what are we called? Sons of God. Treated as sons of God, blessed with all of the good things that rightfully Jesus Christ has earned. He takes us into his house. He makes his goodness our goodness. He makes sinners into saints, children of darkness into children of light. We are reconciled to God, Romans chapter 5 tells us, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And man outside of Christ goes along in life trying to just suppress, not think about, cloud out any notion of the coming judgment of God. But eventually, men and women, every man must face this overwhelming reality. But God has made a way in Christ to instead of meeting us with judgment, to shower us with mercy and with peace. Now, I really could have made an entire sermon about what I'm about to point out to you, but uh, I decided just to throw it out there and let you chew on it for a little while. But think with me for a moment on the power of the testimony of Joseph in Egypt. The testimony of Joseph in Egypt, here is a man who is... For all we assume, he is the only believer in the nation. Pharaoh knows that Joseph serves a different God. Pharaoh is aware of the testimony of Joseph, and he esteems Joseph highly because of his stand for his God. But here the servants of Joseph responded to these foreigners with a proclamation of peace. Here is Joseph, a picture of Jesus Christ in Egypt. Egypt is a picture of this world of sin. Jesus Christ came down from heaven and lived in this sinful world to be our mediator, to be our advocate before the throne of the Father. And the effect of Joseph in his household, the servants of Joseph just lived in a different atmosphere than anybody else in Egypt lived in. So much so that when these foreigners came, he immediately starts to say, hey, listen, don't worry about it. Your God has blessed you. The God of your father has blessed you. What a testimony of, of, of what Joseph's household was like. What a testimony of the power of what Jesus Christ should be doing in you. What a testimony of the power of what Jesus Christ's salvation should be doing in me. Now I should have that effect on everybody around me. The air that is breathed in my environment and in your environment should be 
air of grace and mercy and who God is. And just like Joseph's servant was transformed, maybe he became a believer. We don't know. But certainly he had a different outlook on life than other people in Egypt did. Do we have that kind of an effect on people that live with us? Is that the, is, is, is your home, is my home like a little piece of heaven on earth? That was what Joseph's household was like. So that these men that came rightfully expecting a lashing, rightfully expecting nothing but judgment and punishment, instead they got mercy and grace and peace. Is that the atmosphere of our homes? Think for a moment on that power. Our households should be places of peace. Our households should be places of mercy. Our households should be places of grace, not places of anger, not places of resentment, not places of grudge holding and uh, lashing out against people that, that, uh, that we feel have wronged us. When people who have truly wronged us come to us, what should they find? They should find a blessing. They should find peace and mercy. The third thing that I see here is it is a God of grace of God of grace. We see that in verse 29. Here are these foreign beggars. And little do they know they had done this man. I mean, they, they kind of were concerned that maybe they had inadvertently taken money that, that they were supposed to pay this man. Little did they know that was only the tip of the iceberg of how they had wronged him. But instead of giving them the punishment that they deserved, he treated them to a lavish feast from his own provisions. In verse 33, and this is another just a, a, something that, that jumps off the page of this chapter to me. When they sat these brothers down to eat at Joseph's table, did you catch it how they sat them down? Sat them down in chronological order from oldest to youngest. Now read through that quickly. Don't think much about it, but take a moment and think about it. That must have scared the living daylights out of these men. They didn't ask them the question. All right, who's oldest? All right, you sit here. Second, yep, you come here. No, no, no. It, they got there and it was like there were, place, uh, there were place markers at the table already for them. Judah, you sit here. Simeon, you sit here. And Benjamin, you sit down there. And they're sitting there saying, how does this man know so much about us? And if he knows so much about us, this is not a comforting thought. We've not exactly been good, neighborly, kind people in our lives. We have left a, we have left a trail of blood and tears wherever we have gone. This must have scared them out of their minds. What a picture of God's dealing with us. You ever think about it? God knows who you are through and through. God doesn't just know what you show to other people. God knows what's on the inside. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a really bad thing. God knows all those thoughts and inclinations that pop into our hearts that we suppress down and we say, oh, no, 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 no. That isn't the right thing to think. That isn't the right way to feel. I would be, I, I, it would be a terrible thing for people to know that that was in my heart. God sees it. And yet God loves you anyways. He still lavishly heaps undeserved kindness and grace toward us to feed our hungry souls. And Benjamin here, it says, was given a portion five times more than the rest of them. I think, uh, I say, why in the world did Joseph do that? I think maybe Joseph wanted to see how these brothers of his would respond to some favoritism shown toward their youngest brother. 
Years before, a little bit of favoritism shown toward Joseph had evoked nothing but bitter hatred and antagonism toward Joseph. Now there's not one word of it bothering them at all. Why? Because they were all getting more than they deserved. <laughs> they, none of them deserved this meal. None of them deserved to be sitting at the table of Egypt's royalty. They're beggars. They're coming to beg for food. And I'm getting all this. They realize it's all of grace. And here I am, lavishly blessed by the God of all creation. I realize that any good thing, any, any, uh, anything that I get other than an eternity in hell is by God's grace. I get more than I deserve. We should be truly amazed by grace. And when we are truly amazed by grace, it's hard to envy those who have what we don't have, who have maybe a little bit more, humanly speaking, than we do. Envy melts away in the light of gratefulness, overwhelmed with God's gratitude. Understand something, this same God, this God of peace, this God of mercy and this God of grace is still alive and is still on the throne today. And he crushes man in guilt in order to get him to the cross in repentance and in faith. And because of Jesus Christ, instead of judgment, instead we experience mercy and peace and grace. We don't deserve it. We are sinners by birth and by choice. But just as Judah, that very son, who years before, Judah was the one that instead of, uh, they, they came up with the idea that let's just sell our brother that we hate so much, let's just sell him as a slave. Now Judah speaks up and tells Jacob that he will bear the blame forever if they don't bring Benjamin back home. Ultimately, of course, we remember Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. Uh, Jesus Christ came to bear our blame, to bear our guilt, to pay the price for our sins. And God heaps all of these things toward us in order to draw us to repentance. Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 6 as we close says, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. If we reject, dear sinner, if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, if you have never humbled yourself to come before Jesus Christ, submit yourself to him, and to accept the price of his blood that was shed on the cross for your sins, God's goodness has been poured out to you God's goodness has been poured out to you. His long suffering is, is calling you to repentance. But there will come a day when instead of this goodness of God leading to, you re to repentance, God is going to render to you according to your deeds. And if we are dealt with according to our deeds, we get nothing but an eternal judgment. Oh, dear sinner, come to Jesus today. Come to this one who unlocks the key, who unlocks the door to open up all of God's goodness to you, the mercy and the peace and the grace instead of the judgments. Why would you hold back? Why would you wait another day? And dear Christian, rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts by this very thing. I pray, Lord, that you would remind us of this goodness of God that we bask in as believers today. 
May we go forward for the Lord. May we come just to rejoice in that goodness. And may our hearts be drawn close to you today as never before, rejoicing, drinking deeply from the wells of salvation. And oh, Father, may I pray that if there would be anybody hearing my voice this morning, whether it be online or in this very room, anyone who has not come to Jesus as Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they would not wait another moment but get to Jesus. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen.